Welcome everybody to the Public Safety and Justice Affairs Committee meeting, June fifth. Roll call, please. Carla Rowe, Mr. Gallagher. Here. Ms. Baker. Here. Mr. Tuma. Here. Mr. Brady. Mr. Brady is absent at the moment. Ms. Conwell. Here. We have a quorum. I also like the record to reflect that Council Member Miller is also in attendance. Welcome, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Do we have um, public comment? No, no one has signed in. Okay. In your packet, there's the minutes of May 22nd. If they're in order, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Do I have a, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Against? Thank you. There are no matters before the committee. We have discussion with the Juvenile Justice Center and Intervention Center. New name that I found out last time. And uh, we would like to... Uh, start out and thank everyone from juvenile court for being here uh we consider of all our partners in in justice one of our one of our better partners and and uh, certainly appreciate all the work that you do and the difficulties that you have to deal with daily uh this uh this is an important uh update and, and it, for what we've been working on with you uh and you've obviously been working on diligently and uh, judge if you want to start out thank you i am pleased to stand here today with my partners from across cuyahoga county to present our most significant initiative in many years for juvenile justice reform over the last several months, the court has engaged in a five-day Kaizen process mapping event. The event was facilitated by the Ohio Department of Youth Services with the goal to improve the process of how youth are received at the front door of the court. Our partners from the Adams Board, the Prosecutor's Office, the Public Defender's Office, the Cleveland Police Department, Educational Service Center, and community members worked alongside the court to identify areas of inefficiency, delays, and problems with our current intake process. The end result of the five-day Kaizen process was the vision and plans for the Intervention Center. The Intervention Center will have a tremendous impact for youth and the community as a whole. The operations of the Intervention Center will be provided around the clock for police to make immediate referrals for youth involved in criminal acts. All youth charged with a status or delinquency offense will be screened for risk to reoffend and for behavioral health needs. The intervention center services will be a collaborative process with court staff and mental health agency clinicians working to provide the most comprehensive intake process. It is well documented in national juvenile justice research that upward of 60 to 70% of youth involved in the juvenile justice system have a diagnosable mental health disorder. The intervention center will provide screening for each youth for behavioral health issues and identify their risk to reoffend. This will allow the court and its partners to detect behavioral health issues earlier and intervene more effectively. This will benefit not only the court and our partners who are with us here today, but most importantly for the youth and families of the county. The end result will be return, returning police to patrol, patrol quicker, increased diversion of low-level offenses, shorten case processing time, and vastly improve identification and treatment of behavioral health needs at first contact, all of which will mean better outcomes for our families and community. It is with great pleasure that I stand here today to present the new plans for the Intervention Center with our community partners. Um, so now, when we have a lot of partners. So now I'm going, to introduce, I'm going to have Bridget Gibbons come up here to be one of our first speakers. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, do we, the PowerPoint, am I? Is this being displayed and then do I? Okay, so I just need to click over here. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm Bridget Gibbons. I'm Deputy Director of Programming at Juvenile Court. And uh, while we're very excited to talk about this intervention center, it's been many months in, in work with a lot of collaborative partners. Um, we wanna talk about why this is really important for us. Um, for us, as you know, the problems in our detention center are well-documented and well-known. 
Um, so when we talk about the intervention center, which I oftentimes refer to as the front door, and I use that interchangeably, juvenile justice reform at the deepest end when kids are in our detention center cannot be impacted without the front door being redesigned. So when we look at this last year and some of the problems that we've had, we believe that this intervention center is the first step to true juvenile justice reform that will have a, the greatest impact on our conditions of confinement. Um, and that's done by making sure that the right kids are entering detention and the wrong kids are being diverted away from detention. Um, as you know, conditions of confinement lead to a lot of the disruptions and problems we've had in the last couple years in our detention center. And while we're very optimistic about, about our new leadership in the detention center, um, who you will get to meet later today, we know that the detention center reforms cannot happen without the intervention center being up and running. Um, so when we talk about conditions of confinement and the problems that lead to if your front door isn't working effectively, you're going to have many of the wrong kids with significant behavioral health issues in the detention center, and that impacts every corner of conditions of confinement. That's going to impact uh, overcrowding, um, overtime, worn out staff who are gonna be less patient and, and able to respond to small adolescent behaviors. You're gonna have more youth on youth violence, um, increased confinement for misbehaviors, and the ratio from staff to youth is gonna be impacted on top of all the other things such as cleanliness of the um, detention center, um, everything under the sun is impacted by that. So that's why we feel this initiative here and this reform is gonna have a great impact, not just at the front door, but also in our detention center. Um, so we're going to, um, and I just want to say that this redesign is more about, it's not just about changing the process, but it's about changing the culture and the philosophy of how we handle juveniles when they come in contact with our system. Um, so our current state, which, you know, recent, you know, before we get into that, I just want to say that um, juvenile justice is a highly researched field as of recently. Um, when our intake department was designed, we didn't have all the data and the research to support some of the change that we're talking about today. Um, so our current state um, is not driven by what's best practices, and we're excited about this opportunity. Our current state looks similar to um, kids come in. We look at them as charge and charge alone. We're not taking into account. Um, there's no risk or needs assessment happening. Um, we don't have any behavioral health screening, so oftentimes kids are seen as a charge and processed as a charge. Um, diversion was pretty basic, um, and it was really dependent not on the child's individual needs, but more about what was available in that kid's neighborhood and that zip code and easiest refer to. Um, so kids were also not seen face to face. We would see charges and move them through to the appropriate diversion, um, and it may not have been individualized to meet their needs. Um, and again, there was limited access. One thing that we've done to rethink juvenile justice is really looking at um, best practices, and these kids were not getting um, the same resources that kids on probation, deep into probation, were receiving. Um, and then I think the biggest problem that we had was low-level offenders were receiving tough sanctions far beyond what was needed to address community safety. And um, we have the um, Project Calm, which I think that you're all familiar with, that diverts low-level um, City of Cleveland youth that are involved in domestic violence away from our um, from our detention center. And with this change, we're going to be able to move the uh, Calm Project across the entire county. And so these changes were really driven by um, the National Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice and the Office of Juvenile Justice and, Preven and Delinquency Prevention. Um, and those are two agencies that recommend behavioral health screening at the earliest point in order to reduce those risks of delinquency that are associated with substance abuse and mental health disorders. Um, and so we really want to make sure the earlier we identify those, the faster that we can intervene and intervene appropriately. And another um, foundation that helps us a lot with policy development and has driven a lot of the decisions in this redesign is the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And they recommend that there, I think this is one of the biggest things across the nation that's, um, that we're kind of getting um, and put in place here in our intervention center is this push to really look at the front door. There used to be a large focus on the back end of juvenile justice and in probation, 
But now we're starting to do what other people in the state of Ohio are doing is really move these screening and assessment up to the front end. Um, and, and basically what the research says is, you know, if you can keep low level youth away from your system as much as possible, you're going to have a positive impact on community safety. Um, and they really put an emphasis on cognitive behavioral interventions, which we do heavily in probation, um, but we have not offered up until this time um, in diversion. So we know that it's something that we've known in probation is sanctions and deterrence-based supervision do not do um, as much as family-centered and evidence-based treatments with cognitive behavioral help with. I know it's a lot of words, so if you have questions on any of that, feel free to ask. Um, so what our future state in our intervention center is gonna look like is we're gonna have a centralized intervention center with strong collaboration from a mental health partner that will work um, shoulder to shoulder with our staff. They're gonna provide um, behavioral health assessments to identify any flags for mental health disorders or behavioral health disorders. They're going to provide a risk assessment to see the likelihood for youth to reoffend. Um, and if a child flags in the area of mental health, um, we'll take those cases and we'll base uh, interventions in diversion based around their risk to reoffend and their specific behavioral health issues. Um, there will be, and the best, I think the best part about this is there will be immediate access to services um, that were typically reserved for kids that had to wait until they were placed on probation, which could be anywhere from six months up to a year. And at that point in time, Families are less likely to engage. You kind of, you have to strike while the iron is hot. Um, and then the other benefit for families and, or for our court is gonna be that significant reduction of case processing time. Um, specifically for diversion cases, some kids will be able to come in and be diverted and within three days be done and be able to return back to regular, uh, their regular lives. Um, and especially, we think one of the best benefits of this is gonna be increased diversion for our low level cases, really trying to dislodge them completely from probation and send them back out to our system of care partners. And um, the other thing is going to be that we're going to expand um, Project Calm to the entire county, which will help a lot of those kids, um, those domestic violence kids from being diverted completely from our detention center and back out into our system of care partners. Okay, and I next person is gonna be Linda Torbert from the Adams Board. Yes, yes. On your last point on the significant reduction in case processing time, you said you're going to go down to three days. What was the time frame before? Oh, it was pretty lengthy. Um, I actually don't know the whole. I mean, there was weeks between um, cases being processed, but sometimes kids, if they were going official, it would take months before they would ever get into court. And then between hearings, it could be months after that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon. As um, Bridget mentioned, my name is Linda Torbert. I am the Director of Prevention and Behavioral Health Programming at the Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Services Board. Um, as Judge Sweeney mentioned early on in the presentation, there are a significant number of children who present within the court system who have behavioral health issues. The benefit to the intervention center will definitely uh, prove that kids will be diverted earlier on. A lot of these points I'm reiterating that um, Bridget had mentioned, but some of them are pretty critical um, with the intervention center. So I'll just kind of skim down to the most pertinent point. And I would say that it's the uh, cross-system planning that will occur earlier. More often than not, we're planning uh, when they're embedded into the court system. So it takes a long time to convince jurists that um, these are significant mental health uh, issues, although sometimes that's understood. But the behaviors are of such we can't stabilize those uh, behaviors because they're embedded in the system. And we have a difficult time um, basically um, proving to some of our uh, agency providers that this is not criminogenic behavior. It's really true mental health issues and, and behavioral health overall concerns. 
the other piece is that if we're able to identify those children earlier on at the front door with those unmet needs, they're most likely not to come back to the court, and that's the hope. If we're able to provide um, provide wraparound um, services to support them and, and make sure we have the right service at the right time for those youth. And I think we may have hit most of the points that um, that um, Bridget may have mentioned earlier on in terms of basically um, effectively addressing those behavioral health symptoms. Hello, I'm Sergeant Hageman with the Cleveland Police Department Field Operations. Um, I've been asked to um, come here today to speak in a few of the police benefits. Um, <clears throat> police departments will be able to take some youth that do not meet detention center admissions criteria to the intervention center. Uh, when the juvenile is not accepted at the DH and a parent cannot be located, uh, the juvenile can be brought to the intervention center and uh, put in line with appropriate services. This new process will allow officers to return to patrol uh, in, in much less time. Access to immediate services will reduce new charges that now occur between charging and disposition. <clears throat> From arrest through disposition can take six months. In that time, juveniles end up um, with more charges. Ideally, intervention will help these juveniles avoid further charges. Um, with intervention in place, uh, crisis calls will be handled by identified resources rather than calls to police. So. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cara Davis. I'm a program administrator from Division of Children and Family Services, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about how the Intervention Center can benefit those families who are actively involved with DCFS. Um, the, in the Intervention Center has the potential to um, improve outcomes for those families who are involved with DCFS, as well as reduce the numbers of those children who become active with the Division of Children and Family Services unintentionally through their involvement with juvenile court. Some of the benefits that the um, intervention center um, include are earlier detection of those children who are actively involved with the DCFS system. So of those children that are actively involved with the DCFS system, the intervention center can improve collaboration between DCFS and juvenile court. And as a result of that collaboration, the Intervention Center can engage in cross-system case plan service coordination as well as provide earlier access to diversion programs for those youth in custody. The Intervention Center can also reduce the number of children who become active with DCFS as a result of their involvement with the juvenile court system, primarily through the intent to grant population. DCFS receives on average 200 cases per year for intent to grant custody cases. And of those 200 children, about 30% enter into custody with the agency. And so what we're hoping is that through the intervention center that they can provide earlier system collaboration with DCFS as well as linkages to supports and services for families in the community. Thank you. Uh, one question, yes, ma'am. Uh, to the chair, um, to Ms. Davis, will collaborations be directly with the caseworker at DCFS? How will that work? Yes, it would be directly through case plan collaboration between the caseworker with the family and the court system. Okay, I know they have a team structure now, and I can't think of the term, uh, so where they sit and talk about the cases, so you would, Right now, you're not involved 
uh, or are you will you be involved with this new intervention centers when they sit down in time I can't think of the term that they use but um, when they talk about meet about cases they have the team it's the team approach now where they're sitting are you involved now with that team approach or is this um, something that you'll be so DCFS does have involvement with coordination of services for duly involved kids, but it happens much later in the process. Okay. So hopefully the intention is that by having the intervention center that those children who are active with our agency can be identified sooner. And what happens a lot of times is that cases take a long time to process through the court. And so what we would try to do is try to implement services and, and linkages for those families and children up front rather than down the line families become really overwhelmed over time in terms of trying to get linkages to services. So hopefully this will improve that. Okay, so when you say not involved to the end of processes, we just, I think it was last week, we just had a hearing and uh, we had Michelle from, was standing up here and saying that they were involved in the process, but it was never explained that it was at the end of the process. So I just wanna get clear. So. I, maybe I should rephrase like, it. It's usually maybe in the middle of the process. So typically our collaboration starts like when they're in the court, going through the court process. When the court so process possibly, starts. you know, assigned to probation and maybe actively on probation for a period of time. So this would allow us an earlier opportunity to engage those families. Before they even go to court. Correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have a general question for whoever can answer as to uh, exactly where the proposed uh, intervention center is going to be located. Is, is it going to be physically located at, at the uh, uh, front door to the juvenile detention center, or is the location going to be somewhere else? Tess here, Juvenile Court Administrator. Um, the plan is now um, is to house the intervention center within, within the court, um, maybe move um, some departments around so that um, that way we're not leasing extra space to accommodate the center. And then we have, you know, we'll, we'll have um, employees there on site and we'll be able to house them and office them as well. There's certainly plenty of space available over yes. there. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello, I am Cheryl Mays um, from the Parent Engagement Center, and I've been asked to speak on behalf of the families and the community. And what I'm seeing is one of the benefits of this uh, center is that needs will be identified earlier in the process, not just needs of the children, but also needs of the family. Mm -hmm. And services can be started at an earlier partner process. Mm -hmm. And as some of our te other team members said, some folks can be diverted to services that mm -hmm. in the past they would go to unnecessarily. It'll also give families an idea of what to expect, how the process goes. Um, and, and just as a parent myself, knowing what to expect when you get engaged in a system is crucial. And so parents will have an idea of what to expect those delays will also be minimized if almost not eliminated. Uh, like you said, months of delays can be reduced down to three days, up to three days. And that's a pretty significant delay, especially if you have a family of more than one child and you have one problem child who's involved in this system. So um, again, I think just earlier intervention needs identified early is gonna benefit families and communities as a whole. And then children can be returned to their communities and receive services or provide diversion services close to home. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, through the chair, probably to Judge Sweeney, when will this start and who will monitor the cost savings for this intervention center? Because it sounds like a, a lot of the things that have been discussed so far would produce some cost savings. The, uh, the goal is to hopefully have everything worked out by the end of the year, so it will be up and running, and um, Karen will be monitoring our cost savings. 
honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Judge. Yeah. The um, I think it was mentioned earlier that this program is or this model is in other places in Ohio. Montgomery County has really been our model. Okay. Um, and I would say that is probably I don't know if they're huh. If oh yeah. Tess Neff is going to be talking about that, so I'm okay. going to let her. Okay. Is there? Do you have any other questions for me? No, don't see any. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, while the judge is still standing, I'll give her some appreciation. My name is Greg Musman. Uh, I am the juvenile chief of the Pros Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, my involvement was I was appointed in on January of 2017 when Prosecutor O'Malley was elected and he assigned me to the juvenile division. And the first thing I did was to analyze how we were working our cases, the case processing time. Actually, uh, Councilwoman Conwell, you, you made a very good point. That was one of the largest concerns that I had with respect to delays on what are we, what are we doing with the children that in between their offense versus charging, and what are they doing in between? So it was um, up to us to analyze uh, what were we doing? What were we doing right? What were we could do? What we could be doing better? So, the first thing I want to do is thank Judge Kristen Sweeney um, for her guidance and uh, cooperation in this process. Because I think, uh, Council Members, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to transform the juvenile justice system, and we have the opportunity now. We are facing an epidemic of juvenile violent crime, and what we need to do in terms of the prosecutor's position, is figure a way to get to the children before they make those bad decisions. So we are uh, imploring, and, and thank goodness for all of the community partners here, we want to make sure that each child is not just booked, processed, and sent away. We want to identify what are the issues that these children have that cause them to lead to this criminogenic behavior. Is it mental health? Is it family issues? Is it uh, just the need that they need some some guidance, some parental uh, help. So, ladies and gentlemen, this, this is the point where I think we can strike and where we can look at other areas throughout the country on how do we make this better and how do we help our generation of youth in the Cleveland area. So, uh, with respect to the, um, the cooperation for the prosecutor's office, I, I'm, it's been a pleasure and I can't wait to see what this intervention center does. Uh, other counties have done this. I've reached out to almost every county in Ohio with respect to the prosecutor's office on how they, they charge cases, how they divert cases, how they do it. And I'm very familiar and I'm very comfortable with the leadership and the partnership that we have here that we're going to do what's best for the youth. That's not saying that we're not going to prosecute violent crimes. And the public safety is our number one concern. But that being said, there is a lot more that we can do for the youth of this community. And I look forward to seeing what this intervention center will do. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. Thank you. A um, couple questions on what you just, and I'm not as familiar with the court system, so it might be a question that is, I should know. The, um, how do you define and separate the low risk from those that perhaps you would not offer a intervention with and that you would proceed with the traditional oh. court? So where do you, what type of... Uh, crime does a low-risk offender uh, do for us to say, well, that's low risk, we can afford to give him because we think he's capable of reform? So it, it's, a, it's actually more nuanced than that, and it's a great question, because right now we only divert on the charge and your background, and that eliminates what is the reason that we're doing this. Um, right now, at least my position is, Programming is the main issue, and that's what we're working on the court. So uh, almost all misdemeanors, now there are going to be exceptions, such as weapons charges, um, animal cruelty, other, other things that we may need to um, not divert through the court, but still give the programming. The court can still handle those. That's, it's just saying right now we're trying to avoid them actually physically coming down to a court, hiring an attorney, having court time, police time. So that's not saying that we're not going to treat those issues, but uh, I would actually say the majority of misdemeanors and even low-level felonies. Other counties, other states have done this, and, and, and like Ms. Gibbons stated earlier, 
this has been actually well researched. The NE Casey Foundation and other foundations have been researching the success of the diversion programs. So I think it all comes down to the programming, Councilman Baker. It's, it, programming is essential on stopping the recidivism, stopping the reoffending, and, and stopping others from committing the future crimes. Mr. Tuma. Oh, thank you. Uh, through the chair, uh, thank you for being here today, all of you actually. Um, being in the, in the prosecutor's office, do you have an opportunity to work with the uh, municipalities as far as the div diversion programs uh, go? Because I know, I know when I was in, in Parma a long time ago, I, I got to do a volunteer magistrate over there, and that program actually was very successful. Um, a lot of these kids just, I mean, they're kids, you know, some of them. Correct. Um, and you have to be able to separate, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but you have to be able to separate you know, uh, criminal intent from stupidity sometimes. Mm -hmm. And there's a cost to that, you know, when, when all this stuff, if it comes down to the county and that sort of thing. So um, what, what steps have you taken to work with the local prosecutors or local municipalities as far as working to try to get some of these cases through their local um, courts as opposed to coming down uh, so, to the county? Uh, great question. Uh, what we do is, at least for the prosecutor's office, is I talk to the individual law enforcement agencies. So if it does arise out of Parma, uh, I have had a case where um, we have even sent uh, a robbery through diversion. I had an individual uh, city contact me and say, this kid has never been in trouble in his life, and, and we've done that, and we'd like to put him in our community program. And again, on its face, I, it seemed preposterous, but we talk, we work it out, and what's best for the community and best for the child? Right. And, and that's where the... the um, deference to the community is there. That being said, uh, we want to make sure that it's equal. It's an equal playing ground. And, and this has been something long before I've been a prosecutor is one area shouldn't have lesser resources than another area. We want to bring them all up to par. And so what we've done is worked with the court, uh, worked with Ms. Gibbons. They've actually reached out to every community diversion program to ask, what are the services? What do you offer? And I think this is where we can have the tools for where we can bring one community up to the standard that, say, the Parmas and the other areas have in the world, because we want everyone to get the same opportunity. Right, right. No, I, I appreciate that, and I think it's refreshing to uh, to talk about this sort of thing because it, it, there is a substantial cost associated with it, and not just not just monetarily, but uh, socially. You know, and a lot of these kids, if they get off to a, a quote bad start because of something that they did, and then. It, it can snowball, and you guys all know the snowball effect of what happens when somebody's overcharged or doesn't have the resources to, to get proper counsel, um, or, or if there are behavioral issues that are out there, which I'm glad everybody's starting to understand that they exist, um, then, then I think we as a, as a society take a step back when we don't do that. And I, I think this is very refreshing, I have to say. So thank you. And, and, and even to that point, uh, if kids don't realize that there are accountability and they are going to be held responsible for their actions, there's no incentive to stop that behavior. So we need to hold all of them accountable as well as, as guide and, and teach them sure. that uh, you need to live a law abiding life. And, and along those lines, too, is, is you know, this can, uh, family element to, to all this, too. Um, whatever shape that family might be, um, you know, if you, if you have support at home and like you said, the kids know their consequences for their action. Um, it's not to say that you get, a, you get a free ride if you screw up, but on the other hand, there's gotta be a, a delicate balancing act as to what actually is serious enough to warrant further action or um, more community involvement. And, and I, th I think you guys are kind of under understand that and, and um, are on the right path here, so. I appreciate that. Mr. Miller. Just a comment to, uh, to my colleagues and everybody that uh, no matter how good the diversion program is and no matter how good the risk assessment tools are, you're going to have kids that get diverted and then go out and commit crimes. And, uh, and I think we have to be, uh, be careful not to overreact to that. Because if we uh, if we send them to jail instead, uh, very few people go to jail and come out better. And the, you you just uh, no system is perfect, but but you just have uh, 
have a much better chance with a good diversion program to uh, 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 get things back on the right track before they get out of hand. And, and so uh, uh, I'm, I, I applaud the program, and, and, uh, and it, it, it's absolutely worth doing, and, and we, just have to, uh, we just have to keep in mind that uh, with the unpredictability of human nature, it's just never going to be perfect, but, uh, but it's a whole lot better than what we're currently doing. We are sending too many youth of our community to prison, and we have to do something about it, and we have the opportunity right now mm. Uh, under this court's leadership and under council's leadership. So thank you, uh, thank you to everyone. Yes, ma'am. Um, um, through the chair to Mr. Musman, how many diversion programs are there now? Well, I believe there are 53 community diversion programs um, through each individual area. Um, what uh, I've tried th with partnership through the court program is uh, we've enacted what's, um, we've expanded what's called CALM, and I know they're going to address this, which is a domestic violence diversion program, which is something we essentially, we, we need this. It's, it's a family matter that we don't need to be putting these children into the detention center. We need to actually treat them. Uh, we've also uh, have a pilot program um, for uh, youth between the ages of 8 and 12 years old that are offending on each other, familial uh, sexual offenses on each other. So we've worked with partnership agencies, Guidestone and Abraxas, to treat the issue and give uh, boundary development rather than just prosecute them and put them through the system. So we're, we're working on those. And then we have uh, also some other programs. But uh, as Judge Sweeney, I don't want to step in someone else's presentation, but I mean, there's, there's firearm prevention training. There's shoplifting training. There, there are other programs that we can enact here. And I, we have the opportunity right now to expand. Um, are you guys taking a look at a creative look at uh, fitting the punishment to the action? I'm sorry? Fitting the punishment to the action or to the crime. Well, of course. And, and everyone and needs to be held action. accountable. And But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, a shoplifter should be sitting in the detention center for three days. Uh, there's, there's a difference of having a, a, a very conscious, fair hand. And... At the same time, youth need to be held accountable. And if you rob someone with a firearm, if you commit a shooting or a murder, well, you I'm have to be about, held. I'm talking about the low level. And low like level. You, like, like you stated, the shoplifting. They could be doing it for what, I don't know, a truth or dare, what, whatever the case may be. Say they break the window. That's vandalism charge. But is it something that they should really get sent in? So fitting the, the, the breaking of the window of, having that youth go to that store and paying homage and cleaning it up and actually working off, you know, it's Council, like when you're speaking did. my language, you need, right. you so, need some fair accountability and you just need to know that you can't do this again and you need to make the victim whole. And, and that's, that's what we are here for. They, is hate, to, they hate extra work. Well, they, they hate extra work. That's, <laughs> that's so life. We all had teenagers, so we know they hate also, what's the buy-in from the state? Uh, the state has been a wonderful partner. Uh, I, I met them, actually, I think within 30 days to 60 days of being appointed the juvenile division chief. And I, I speak with partners through ODYS on almost a weekly basis, through conference calls, through the chief legal counsel, the assistant director. I, I've made it a uh, mission. I've, I've personally visited all of their prison facilities I've uh, tried to figure out and, and speak with other prosecutors' office with the state on, on what we can do better. And, and that they've been an essential partner. I, I, I have to say, uh, without their guidance, I don't know if I would have felt as comfortable as a prosecutor with public safety issues at mind. But they, they have assured me, and they've given me, they've given me the information and where I can feel comfortable that if this court gets the proper programming, the proper tools, the proper funding, which they've uh, supplied some funding, uh, we can make this happen. We're going to we're going to change the community because of this. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Just a question. Um, and it sounds like you've got this covered. Any concern that there would be a youth offender that you would not want to send to the diversion program, but family hires an attorney and he fights for the diversion program, and you put someone in it that you particularly would not like to see and needs to be accountable. Any 
concern about that? Well, and I, I think the public defenders after me, uh, they are one of the most aggressive groups. So I, I think whether, <laughs> whether you're hired or not, uh, I have nothing but respect for the council that's assigned, that's yeah. appointed through our public defenders program. I, I think they can assure themselves, and okay. Judge Sweeney is a former public defender, just because you don't pay for it doesn't mean they don't drive the prosecutor's office just as crazy. Yeah. So that being said, it is not, it, it's about fundamental fairness. Okay. Uh, a hotshot lawyer isn't going to make okay. a difference for me. It's, it's all about the youth, and it's about the community. Just asking. Thanks. You said that, um, that this has been, it, there's been data collection on this. What's the genesis of, of the crisis that I guess we find ourselves in now? I think every generation that has come up since the beginning of mankind has always pointed to the new generation as being more problematic mm -hmm. and not understanding how they're going to make it the next day, let, let alone the next century. Um, what, what's the genesis of this? Is, is this the breakup of the family? Is this the um, what? Well, this is a, a multi-layered issue. I'll, I, I will go with the number one most obvious to me is there are too many guns in the community right now, and there is too much access for young men and women to have access to these firearms to commit crimes. So number one, we need to educate each and every youth the power of a firearm, that you cannot brandish a firearm, you cannot commit violent crime. I have a very low tolerance for violent crime in our community. I mean, I can support the diversion programs all day, but when you commit a violent crime, that is a different story. As, as the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office, we are here to make sure that each and every one of you are safe when you walk down the street, and that, that is my goal. That being said, uh, we need, there's family issues, there's drug issues, there's separation, mm -hmm. there's, but right now, if I'm gonna give you one answer, I'm gonna say firearms. We have to do something about the guns in the street. And it's illegal firearms. It can be, Firearms that are accessed to their parents through mm -hmm. well, legal that would firearms. Well, it would be a stolen yeah. firearm. Well, every every youth can't tell you carry one. Correct. But it, it's it, the access everywhere. It, it's, it's overwhelming at this point, and we need to do something. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yes, ma'am. On those same lines, we keep hearing the drug epidemic, that that is the number one issue that seems to be driving mostly in our schools, so I'm surprised that uh, the drug epidemic didn't come up as number one or even number two, it sounds like. I see the, you know, the family, of course, guns, of course, but I would think that the driving force would have been uh, the drug epidemic that's out there and you know, what we're trying to deal with on, on many levels, but especially the juvenile in our schools. Well, that, that doesn't seem to be the number one uh, issue or maybe guns are related to that because of the drug epidemic. And then that goes to Councilman Gallagher's, I, I think your point as well, is it's, it's multi-layered, but if you have heroin typically affects, I think 18 to 24 year olds are the, the overdose range that we've had for the, I think the 850 that we had last year. That's not to say that they don't affect mm -hmm. the families. So you have the parents that are using heroin that are not taking care of their children, that are not feeding their children, that are not doing this. So maybe a drug would uh, force the child to find a way to get money to take care of their sisters and brothers. And I've, I've seen that situation. And that's where the Parenting Project, DCFS, the Adams Board, that's where this partnership really comes in. Because it's, it's not a one answer where I can, if I pulled every gun, we'd still have juvenile crime. So it, if we stopped drugs, we'd still have juvenile crime. But we need to do something more. And, and that's where we are. May I follow? Mm -hmm. so, so the the juvenile age that we're talking about, you're saying that it's not the 18 to 21 with guns. You're talking about juveniles I'm, under 18 with guns? I am I would say there is, from 12 to 17 years old, there is a terrifying amount of young men in this community that use firearms on a daily basis. And it's... Their brains are not developed. There's impulsive behaviors. It, it is frightening that we have to do something. We have to educate them, their families, the community. They're, this is a partnership that we need to bring out there and, and say enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sam Amata, Public Defender's Office, Juvenile Division Supervisor. Leah? Hi, I'm Leah Winsberg. I'm an assistant public defender. Who's been sitting, she's our policy advocate, which means she sits on a whole bunch of committees, so mm -hmm. I don't have to. It's um, not an official <laughs> title, but. <laughs> um, Councilperson Baker, just to your, just to add to Mr. Musman's uh, comments, I think a, a minor, the decision to devote him would be based also on um, assessments that would be done at the front door. Uh, and their OES and the OES is the risk assessment, and then the uh, mental health behavioral health screener is the Maisie. And so those recommendations will be made based on the, the folks who are administering and reading the assessments, made to the prosecutor's office, who then decides whether or not the case goes official or it goes to diversion. And that kind of <coughs> goes, <coughs> excuse me, to our first point uh, on our uh, slide there that we, we hope, oh, sorry, that we hope with the uh, additional information that is provided to the prosecutor's office at the time of filing the charges will make for better charging. Uh, right now we're seeing, uh, in some cases, many, many uh, counts filed that are um, filed in the alternative. Um, sometimes you get 18, 17 counts where four or five would do. So we're hoping that with that additional information, it can make the charging decision a little more individualized to that particular um, juvenile. And uh, our second bullet point there, I, I think you may be aware in the past there's been some concerns about access to uh, diversion programs for especially youth in the, in the actual city of Cleveland. Uh, I think the suburbs had uh, some alternatives to uh, official filings, but they were limited in the city of Cleveland. So we're hoping that this assessment center, uh, as it's currently planned, will uh, alleviate that concern, deal with that so that uh, there's an equal fair access uh, for diversion program to all youth uh, in the community, <laughs> not just the, the suburban uh, youth. Um, we also feel our third bullet point there that services implemented very near the event are likely to be uh, more, uh, uh, will work better. Um, I think studies have shown that uh, to, um, uh, um, to divert or is better, but that uh, if you're going to apply a sanction, it's much better to apply it right at the beginning rather than wait two or three or four months while the case plays out and wait for a dispositional hearing. So uh, we think that will be a positive thing. And then uh, even if cases are not diverted, we're, we're hoping, uh, we're assuming that when they are assessed at the front door that they will be still offered services so that when a dispositional hearing takes place, if it does, uh, the youth will already be uh, taking part in programming and hopefully if that is going well, that would allow him to remain in the community and continue with that programming. And if it's not going well, the judge uh, or the magistrate can tweak the disposition to account for that and perhaps try uh, another uh, another alternative. So we're, we're uh, outlining at least these four bullet points. I'm sure there'll be more when the program actually gets off its feet, but we're hoping that these, uh, these things at least are gonna be a positive result uh, from the assessment center. Um, so we, we still have um, some concerns with the implementation that we're trying to work through with the court. Uh, the actual process on getting through the front door, who makes the diversion decision, uh, exactly how it's made, what particular cases are gonna be diverted, what aren't. Uh, at this point, it's my understanding that felony cases will not be diverted, <coughs> except unless there's some uh, reason to do so, extraordinary reason to do so. But we're still working through some of the details. We're not entirely uh, um, content with the process as it is now, but we're hoping that we can work through those things and, and come up with a, uh, a final product that benefits uh, the community. Um, so I don't know, Leah, do you wanna add anything that uh, I think one of, the, one of the main things to take into account with uh, our last bullet point is that regardless of whether the youth is diverted or it goes official, if, they're, if they have access to the services that both they and their family really uh, do need to be successful, that that will eliminate the deeper involvement with the system. So the picking up of multiple charges once they first entered our front door, which just compounds the case by the time it makes it to the, the judge or magistrate for disposition, it looks like a totally different kid when there's one misdemeanor versus six misdemeanor cases that have all happened within a span of a few weeks of time. So these, these types of behaviors, uh, the majority of children age out of delinquent behavior. And this is not uh, a system where we're dealing with criminogenic kids day in and day out. There are those criminogenic kids and usually they turn into adults that commit those crimes as well. However, the majority of what we see is uh, a need to address something in the community that's not currently happening. So 
with specialized services that are being accessed at the very front door, we are very hopeful that the types of charges, the types of cases that are coming through will be a little bit more appropriate and individualized and will hopefully reduce the amount of children that are placed on probation and uh, placed in the detention center and sent to ODYS because ultimately the community is where they can be best rehabilitated and work out whatever they're dealing with at that point in adolescence and become successful community members. So. Yeah, I, I think sort of the, the big picture in this is that we're hoping that the focus shifts away from these are bad kids, they need to be put away, they need to be punished, they need to be held accountable to, yeah, that's that's maybe the case, but there's also issues going on in these kids' lives that maybe we can address that would uh, avoid them sinking deeper and deeper into the juvenile justice system and then eventually graduating into the adult system, which happens far too frequently uh, in our uh, business. We, we see our clients graduate into our funding division and, and uh, end up in uh, adult prisons. So uh, just to sum up, we kind of feel at this point that the interview, that the intervention center is a, is a good idea at the right time. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sure. ma'am. Just one quick, quick question in, in regards to it. So I'm just trying to picture this. So kid gets arrested by the cop. The cop brings them to juvenile justice center. So this program, instead of letting that kid sit in that detention center for whatever case of time, there's going to be some kind of mechanism the intervention where they will be dealing with that kid right away to see if it should go to a diversion and they should be released in the custody of their parents or if they need to remain longer. Am I understanding? Is that how? I'll take a shot at that. Uh, and then I know Leah has more, is more aware of the exact process than I am in, the, in this. But for the very serious offenders end up in the detention home. There's a screening instrument. Um, so that they, uh, the felony one and two offenders are held, and other uh, offenders are held in the detention home, and they would not be part of this process. But the lower level, the car thefts, the drug cases, uh, the, the, at the felony level would be coming uh, through the assessment center. And uh, at that point, um, there would be this assessment process taking place and a decision made on how to handle the case. What about sexual, sexual assault? assault? Um, that, that's in the, I think we're in the process of working some of that out, um, but uh, for example, there's, there's uh, four different sexual offenses, at least, that I can think of. One is a misdemeanor. I'm not sure how that's going to be handled at this time. I think that's still being negotiated. Um, but most of those would be felonies. Most of those would be going to the prosecutor's office uh, immediately. That was one thing I don't think I explained very clearly in the beginning, and I apologize for that. Um, Amongst the big group, we've had lots of subcommittees to think about the very specific details you're asking. So there will be, for police officers, they'll have a field card that will instruct them which way to go with the child based on the charge that they understand it. So, hi, so we'll continue to keep our detention center admissions criteria the same. So those are, um, those are very specific charges that the police are pretty well informed in. Um, and so obviously a sexual assault, especially of a child that's in the home, are kind of automatic um, detainments for those until a situation can be identified. For other kids that are still felony level, that's not an automatic. Um, those will be kids that the police, if they have them with them, um, will bring them to the intervention center, which will be through the front door of the court versus through the Sally Port as a detention admission. And so then those kids will get an immediate screening by a mental health by our court staff, and then mental health folks will identify the immediacy and the need of services, um, specific to kids who um, like domestic violence, similar to our calm kids. If they need respite, we'll hopefully we'll have um, access to a respite um, through the expansion of calm through our therapeutic um, foster beds, um, and then some kids will be walk in. Um, so if they caught a charge a couple days before, they'll have a scheduled appointment. Our intervention specialist will reach out to them and say, you know, I need you to come in on Tuesday. We'll meet with you, and they'll work around the family's schedule. Um, and then parents will be able to also walk in. So it'll be separated from detention. We'll maintain our detention flow the way it is. We'll have our intervention center for those higher um, felony and low-level uh, misdemeanors. And then most kids will be brought in through scheduled appointments. But all kids will get the same process for the diversion OYAs, the Maisie screening, 
and if needed, a mental health comprehensive assessment. Well, um, I know you have some low-level offenders, but what about uh, first offenders um, that do a felony crime? Is there going to be any special so, look at their yeah. case? Yeah, so we um, actually have sat down um, with the prosecutor's office, the public defenders, and um, some other folks from the court to take a look at um, developing the criteria for diversion grid. So it's actually broken down based on charge um, and the likelihood to reoffend. Um, so that is, it's still in the works, but I think we're really close to getting the final stamp <coughs> of approval on that. So it really does break it down based on first time offenders, specifically misdemeanors, unruly truancies, those are like automatic diversions. Um, we want this diversion center to take into account um, those repeat low-level kids so that it's not an automatic, okay, now you go official, but to continuously reassess why that first attempt at diversion did not work. So I would assume um, with the advent of gangs, uh, gang members are not walking in the front door. If they're being charged for gang activity, no. I mean, the the way that this is, you know, intended to work is that whatever happens in the community, if it's a serious offense that qualifies for them to be held in the detention center, the police are bringing them in and booking them in the DH. If the offense meets the criteria we've identified and the child undergoes the risk assessments and they don't feel that there is a need to put the child in detention, then the child will return to the community with services immediately. And so it's not um, necessarily that the, you know, for those that aren't being brought in by the police, there is going to be those appointments. So for those offenses, they would be very low level where the police would not otherwise be bringing that person into detention to begin with. So the, the, the goal is to try not to increase the net or not widen the youth that we're bringing into the system and having contact with the court. So if, if their offense in the community wasn't high enough for the police to arrest and bring in otherwise, then they're, not, they're going to be scheduled at a, another time to come into the court for the assessment so that okay. we we're not increasing their contact with the system, okay. if that answers your question. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Pastor Aaron Phillips. I have the privilege to pastor Sure House Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio, 113, 18 Miles Avenue. Best place to be on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, <clears throat> we also have the uh, Cleveland Clergy Coalition, and, um, which is made up of all the African-American clergy groups across the Cuyahoga County, from United, United Pastors and Missions, um, Baptist Ministers Conference, Baptist Pastors Council, and several others. Um, Pastor C.J. Matthews was supposed to be with me here today, but uh, he had a grandson who is graduating. I think um, this is probably a time for celebration. It's one of the best things that our county has ever done. Uh, we have finally figured out how to unite and come together for what of crisis that is happening and really bring a solution together uh, to a real problem. Uh, I really want to commend these. We started meeting because of our relationship with the county prosecutor and um, then with the juvenile court and now with uh, other community groups. We meet every month to talk about what we can do to help our young people. Uh, when the county prosecutor won the election, uh, one of the first things we thought was important for us is to address the problem that was happening with our young people. And uh, I am just so excited about what our community, our elected officials and county officials and workers are doing something positive. If there was ever a time for the Plain Dealer and the Channel News to be here, uh, to be at a meeting, it was this one right here. And uh, I just want to commend everyone for we're, we're getting it, we're really getting it, that we're better off working together than trying to you know, work separately. And I really thank God for what we're doing. As, the, as from the 
clergy perspective with this intervention uh, center, it will we are we are going to be providing uh, volunteers for to help and be mentors to these young people on a regular basis. Uh, we are all in on this, and we not only from people who are pastors, but also members of our churches. And uh, we are ready and ready to be engaged, and we are already being engaged and looking forward to bringing a solution. This morning, I was a little late today, and I got to go now, but uh, we had a clergy meeting with the county executive. He came out to the United Pastors meeting when we were all there, Reverend Cavus and I, and I told him we were coming here and what we were doing. So he asked me, well, of course, his county executive is going to ask me, well, how much is this going to cost? And that is the best thing about this, that we're not even here to ask you all for any money. We're just letting you know this is what we're going to do. We got some funding already, and we're ready to roll this out. And this is a way to do things. This is a model for how things ought to be done in Cuyahoga County from now on. And I want to commend all, everyone for what we're doing today. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Hi again, Tess Neff, Juvenile Court Administrator. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out to Karen Lippman, um, the court's deputy um, director of fiscal. It was her idea, actually. She thought it would be nice if we presented to you to make you aware of what's going on. And um, thank you for allowing her to get us on your agenda today. Um, significant benefits will be derived from the intervention center that will directly and positively impact the juvenile court. One is there is going to be fewer youth on probation. As it is now, 50 to 60% of the youth on probation are misdemeanors and unruly kids. So this is what we want to prevent. In turn, with the Intervention Center, because we'll be able to serve those kids in the community, it's going to allow our probation staff to focus on the deep end high risk kids and devote their time to those youth who, who really need it. Um, right now, a lot of them are spread so thinly because they have high caseloads, mainly in part because of this high, the high misdemeanors and unruly's we have on probation. So that's one huge benefit. Um, another is the youth who are not able to be diverted because of their charge and the circumstances surrounding their case, they are going to come to court well assessed, which is not what happens now. So when they come through the door for their case before the judge or magistrate, that piece is going to be done. We're already going to know their needs and their wants. And we can start interventions now when they come through the door as opposed to waiting until they're adjudicated and placed on probation and waiting for that disposition date. Because that's where I think um, Mr. Musman and the Pro um, Public Defender's Office both alluded to this. When you have these time frames of, of months because cases have to be continued due to no fault of the jurists, it's because they need to get the assessments and that that takes time, they're going to have that piece. So these kids aren't going to be out in the community picking up crimes because they just have downtime and no one's helping them out, no one's supporting them. So that's a big shift. Um, and it's, it's going to prove um, very beneficial, not just for the families, but for our community because there's going to be less victims of crime, we believe. Also, it's an opportunity for us to really take a hard look at our community diversion programs. Prosecutor Musman mentioned there's over 50, which is true. And what we found is there's inconsistencies and there's not uniformity on the services they offer. And we want to change that. And um, I really want to thank um, Prosecutor Musman on this because he really does believe in, in diversion efforts, and he's working with us in our um, intake and diversion mediation group to go ahead and um, you know assess those, and we'll have quality assurance in place to take measures so that if a kid, regardless if they go to East Cleveland or Rocky River, they're getting the same tremendous services, so they're all treated equally and fairly. This is huge. Um, increasing the diversion with the in intervention center is going to decrease out-of-home placements. Karen has speculated, and I'm not going to hold her to this number, um, to the tune of a savings to our court's budget of over a million dollars, potentially, because we're servicing these kids on the front end, so therefore, they're going to be helped in the community and not have to be sent away somewhere, where a lot of times their families are unable to visit, depending where they are. So that's a huge sea change, and it's a philosophical shift as well. And um, it's, it's proven greatly beneficial in other communities, and we think we're going to see the same here. 
Um, so it's, it's a win-win, it's a savings, but it's also more impactful for the kid and their family. Also, I, I, someone mentioned about there'll be fewer court hearings, and, and that makes sense because judges and magistrates aren't going to have to continue hearings for assessments because that child's coming through the door already assessed or largely packaged. Um, so that, that's a, a huge, um, it'll streamline the, the court process for sure. Um, the other thing is, if you aren't all aware, we are the last of the top six counties to embrace an intervention center, which is truly a philosophical shift. I mean, Montgomery County's done it, Franklin, Hamilton, Lucas, um, I'm missing one. But we're the last of the six. We should have been the first. Um, we're, we're late to the game, but we figured it out. We've done the research. We've worked together. And I can't thank our partners enough. I mean, they're tremendous. It's been a truly gratifying collaboration. We've argued now and then, but it's, it's all good. Okay, the next slide. Summit, yes, Summit, thank you. Before I talk about the tremendous um, positive impacts the Intervention Center will have on the Detention Center, um, I'd like to introduce um, the court finally was able to hire, after a long national search, um, a Director of Detention Services. And Mr. Delbert Montgomery is with us today um, to observe. He just started May 14th. Um, we are privileged to have him. Um, it, it, um, it, it, was, it was a tough search to find someone. He comes with us with a, a vast array of experience, all in juvenile facilities, which is key. He's managed and supervised in every role he's had with juveniles, large facilities to medium to small, um, United States Air Force background. Um, every job he went to, they brought him in to fix the problems. So I was really relieved to hear when he said, what you're experiencing is not unusual. So he's, he's still getting the lay of the land. Um, he's got his pulse on things. Um, he's a presence. He's respected. And um, working together with him, we're going to see great things in the future and a, and a big, big shift. Um, and he's a child advocate as well. So we've got the best of both worlds here. He's, he's security and safety minded, um, high on training. So we'll, we'll, you'll see a lot of positive things coming from our detention center. So the front door or the intervention center, it's going to increase um, the diversion of misdemeanor and unruly cases, as I mentioned. This is significant to the population in the detention center because on an average day, it's between 10 to 15 of those youth are misdemeanor or unruly kids in our detention center. And we want to avoid that like the plague um, because those kids don't need to be in there and we know that. And this intervention is going to help us address them and benefit them without having to put them in the detention center until we figure out what to do. It also um, will decrease the low-level offenders, such as the misdemeanors, from intermixing and mingling with high-risk kids because studies will show, and, and it, the data is there, that it's very detrimental. These kids are traumatized. And, you know, usually kids who come to the court for any reason have some sort of trauma, and for us, to beat that down on them again is just wrong, and it's unacceptable, and this is a way to correct that. It also allows the detention to focus on the youth, as I said, who are the biggest risk to public safety and themselves. It will allow our detention staff to have more one-on-one -on -one time. Um, Mr. Montgomery has plans with how he wants his, his staff to inter intermingle and, and you know, interface with the, with the children down there. And it will also give, with the reduction in the population, it's going to allow Mr. Montgomery the opportunity. He wants to have ongoing training constantly. And it will allow him to take small groups off the housing units to conduct that training with the less population. Then we won't have to have everyone on every housing unit at every minute of the day. So that is all I have. And if anyone, if anyone has questions, um, that's fine. If not, I'll introduce the last speaker. Any questions? Well, you know what? I'm sorry. There's one thing I wanted to mention to you about the detention center. I apologize. We had the first part of a two-part um, assessment. I think you are aware we contracted the juvenile court and we um, contracted with the Children's Center for Law and Policy out of Washington, D.C. They came highly recommended. The executive director is Mark Soler um, from Ohio ACLU, Case Western Reserve. And we had a lot of negative things going on. We engaged this um, group, and they were here a few weeks ago, and they come, it's a national team of experts, 
And the first part included an educational expert and a um, uh, med medical expert. And they had a staff attorney. And we had a report out, and they're going to do the same again. We still have to address other things, some conditions of confinement, um, mental health, other issues. So it's going to be very complex and comprehensive. They will provide us at the outcome with a very thorough report, not just what's wrong, but how we can take steps to fix it. And Judge Sweeney and I were very clear when we um, met with them. We said, we need realistic goals here, not pie-in-the-sky aspirations. And we made them aware that, you know, everyone's under budget constraints, so we need to be able to work within that. Just wanted you to know that piece. Okay. Any questions? Wait. Yes, sir. Uh, just through the chair, uh, just along those lines, um, as, as, as a benchmark, I mean, would it be possible, I guess, again, through the chair to, to maybe have you folks come in and I don't, uh, you tell me what a good time would be, six months, something like that, to just get an, an update as to how things are going and whether you're seeing cost savings and, and yes. the programs working, you know, that, that sort of thing. Absolutely. We would relish that opportunity. And also, Karen and, and Mark Major, who's um, a deputy court administrator over fiscal, we would like to appear before you separately, just tell you the good things we're doing financially with spending some of the special revenues, um, cost savings, increase um, revenue we brought in. We want to make you aware of that. But it's, it's a separate, um, you know, agenda item. But we would like to do that for you as well. Yeah, no, I'd appreciate that. I think that'd be a, a, a good thing to do to... Yes. to um, See if there's anything that needs to be tweaked, or um, you know, uh, how the how everything's going. Yeah, because so. it is a work in progress. Sure, absolutely. And going back to your opening, um, we really do appreciate our relationship that we have with the juvenile court. Thank you. It is unique, considering the other relationships that we have. Not that they're bad, but we have more of an open relationship with you, and I think it works very well. It uh, certainly makes us want to be part of whatever you're doing and to address the issues that you have, and, and those indeed are unique. Um, to Ms. Lipman, she's, she was here, I think, when we started, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we've had our moments. I mean, uh, she's gone through the wars, not, not necessarily with me, but with the county and the new government, and there was a lot of push and pull and uh, she, she certainly uh, came through and uh, represented the, uh, the court well. And we, we love having her come to our meeting. She's always here, it seems, and, uh, and always helpful to us. So we, 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 we look forward to working with you. We want to stay in our lane. We understand our place. Uh, we don't want to get out of that lane, although every two years when it's budget time, everybody <laughs> smiles and comes to our lane. Um, but that's our job, and uh, we, I just want to tell you how, how we appreciate the relationship that we have with the court and look forward to continuing that. We do as well. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Tim McDevitt, uh, Deputy Court Administrator. Uh, there have been a, a couple questions about um, uh, the support we had from the state. Uh, and as you, you see here on our PowerPoint, uh, the state has been a real driver behind this. Uh, they have offered us uh, and, and have given us uh, $872,000 to fund the assessment and services to, to start this program. Uh, they also uh, facilitated the process. This was, uh, we, we mentioned Kaizen just briefly, but this was uh, five days all day of all of uh, court, our court staff and many of our community partners that are here uh, working uh, to map the process and, and come out with a better process. And uh, ODYS staff uh, facilitated that whole process for us. Um, so so we're, as, as uh, Pastor uh, Phillips mentioned, we're not asking for funding today. Uh, we, we're able to fund it through the grants from the state uh, we, we're planning on expanding CALM uh, by reallocating some existing um, BHJJ dollars. And then also, we're not going to be asking or adding new staff either. Uh, as, as probation caseloads shrink, as we're able to uh, divert more kids, we're just going to be reallocating staff 
there's uh, there's no need for us to to add new staff and and that's something that we believe in that's something we've also seen that happened in the other uh, six uh, major counties that have done this they haven't had to add staff either uh, but there's also potential savings uh, as we've mentioned a, a few times uh, our hope is to uh, divert most misdemeanors and all unruly cases from making it to probation to really making it to, to a court hearing in the first place. Uh, and, and if we can do that, uh, they, they don't access our deeper end services. They do not go into residential placement. Uh, last year, uh, we spent $1.2 million on residential treatment for misdemeanor and unruly cases. So if we can divert uh, ninety percent of them, ninety-five percent, uh, will have uh, a tremendous savings. Uh, as as Tess mentioned, we'll have a uh, fewer court hearings that will will eventually have another savings. Uh, having intervention, uh, having assessment at the beginning, will prevent us from duplicating services not just internally in the court, but with our other systems partners. Uh, if we're talking with CFS at the very beginning we're not both putting in family counseling. Uh, we're, we're discussing that, case planning, and deciding which one of our agencies will put in the family counseling. So we're not gonna duplicate things. Uh, and then the lastly, lastly is uh, the reason why ODYS is funding this uh, is because they believe, and they've seen this in other counties, is if, if, and this goes back to the very beginning of our presentation, if we can fix the front door it will impact the very deepest end. Uh, they're funding this because they believe that the 14, 13, 14, 15 year old that we're diverting today and, and providing with immediate services today will not be a 17 year old uh, with a very serious charge that we're looking at sending to ODYS uh, three or four years from now. Uh, if we give kids the services they need, and we know what they need through assessment, but if we can give them the services they need at the moment they need them, uh, we're gonna be much more successful. So that's actually it for our entire presentation, um, but we would welcome any, any questions on, on any part of it. Uh, just one yes, ma'am. Just if you could send the uh, assessments I'd like to look at. The we talked about a lot of assessment tools. If you could just send some uh, plain copies of some of the assessments Absolutely. that you guys use. Thank you. Ms. Miller. Uh, my question is about the state funding. Uh, is the state funding sustainable or is this funding that they're giving us to get this started, but then we're gonna have to pick this up at some point in the future? You know, that, that's unclear. It's, it's not promised to us. Uh, I, I will say that uh, we have been, and, and, and Councilman Miller, yeah. you'll remember, we had a, a big meeting in the ninth floor uh, where we very publicly and vocally indicated to the state that we weren't funded sufficiently. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we asked them to do was either ch uh, change the reclaim formula or... Um, uh, take some of the, the uh, rollover funds from other counties and, and provide them to us. I, I think that's what they've done here. Uh, th this, this funding is not through uh, targeted reclaim. It's not through the reclaim formula. It's something they uh, presented to us if we could do this. Our hope is that uh, we're successful and they would like to sustain this. I think... Uh, Eventually, we're going to see, uh, particularly if we can reduce the number of residential placements, we're going to see some ability to s sustain there. Um, but uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question at, at this point. But, but we're optimistic. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Well, again, thank you all for being here. We greatly appreciate it. And Judge will contact you as far as follow-ups going forward. Uh, as always, if there's anything that we can do, we certainly are here to help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Miscellaneous business?